I think uh, we have all the panelists with us. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I think we can begin now. Yeah. Rohan, you can do this. Start the video. It's off. Yes, sir. I think we can see you. We can see you. Sanjana, can you can you hear me, Sanjana? Yeah, we can hear you as well. Okay, fine. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so the topic for today is water and climate change and how the two are inextricably linked. Uh, so this webinar is being organized by Global Shapers Community Bangalore in association with Climate Reality Project India. Why waste? And it is being supported by State of Youth and Worldview Education. So I'm going to play a quick video to uh, uh, introduce Global Shaper community to you. Just give me a moment. Imagine a group of very dynamic young people who are always thinking, how do we need to improve the world? How can we be the voice of our generation? The Global Shapers community is a global network of inspiring young people addressing local and global challenges. We believe in a world where young people are central to solution building, policy making, and lasting change. Shapers are not only incredibly capable individuals, but they're ambitious. They want to be a part of something that matters, that has meaning, that has purpose, and that has impact. And a lot of the projects that we're working on are really scalable, like including citizen engagement, sustainable development, uh, human rights, education. There is a large population in Delhi which does not have access to food. We are connecting K To ensure the voice of young people is present anywhere the agenda is shaped. The forum is bringing us all together and creating this momentum for us to actually make things happen. All the curators of all the hubs come together. They are really open and eager to learn. Being able to meet with our leaders, being able to be a part of policy making is really, really important to me because it really means that we are owning the future and we're taking it into our hands. You need three things to be a global shaper. You need to be in your 20s when you apply or are nominated. You need the right combination of your potential and your achievements. And you must commit to work with your peers to improve the state of your community. And if you have these things, please join us. Can you hear me now? Um, are you able to have a look at the video? I 
think there was a glitch in the middle. Is it fine now? Is my audio, audio fine now? Yes, yes. It's fine. Yeah. I can hear you loud and clear. All right. Okay. Um, so let me begin by introducing our panelists for the day. Uh, we have Kanil uh, Shashikant Dalvi with us, who's the National Coordinator for Water Vertical uh, with Climate Reality India. Uh, Colonel uh, served with the Indian Army from 1969 to February 2002. During that time, he participated in the 1971 war to liberate Bangladesh. He was also involved in cutting edge technological uh, uh, achievements to enable defense machinery to operate at sub zero temperatures in high altitudes. Post retirement, he implemented Pune's first rooftop uh, rainwater harvesting project in 2003 in his housing society. Voice is not clear, it's not audible. Uh, are the others able to hear me? Okay. Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, this resulted in a tanker water free society which saved costs and improved the water table in Biman Nagar. After that, he started spreading awareness on water conservation through his organization, Parjanya. He successfully helped more than 500 different organizations like housing societies, schools, colleges, hospitals, industry to uh, improve the fall falling groundwater table in their locations and to overcome water shortages. He attended the Climate Reality Leadership Training at Melbourne, uh, Australia in 2014. It was a three-day workshop uh, uh, conducted by Nobel Laureate Al Gore. Since then, he has been tirelessly spreading awareness on climate change and its adverse impacts. We're very uh, happy to have you on the panel today, sir. Audio is not clear. Sajana, audio is not clear. Sir, I think there's uh, some issue with your connection. Could you just... Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, they're giving me network bandwidth is low. Okay. Uh, could you just speak to uh, someone about it quickly? Yeah. Moving Today's on. curfew. Yeah, nobody can come in here. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, sir. Um, moving forward, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Vishwanath S., famously known as the Zendrain Man. Um, Vishwanath sir holds uh, a master in urban planning from CEPT Ahmedabad. The internet Zen Rain Man is an influential storyteller, writer, and educator on sustainable water and sanitation. Together with his wife, architect uh, Chitra Vishwanath, he runs Biome Environmental Solutions, a firm specializing in ecological architecture and Biome Trust, a nonprofit that works on water conservation, management, and sustainable sanitation. Biome is recognized for its work with a wide range of groups, students, communities, volunteers, and informal labor groups such as farmers, plumbers, construction workers, uh, and well diggers, the Bowie community. He's also the director of NBE, NIE Mysore, advisor to Agyam Foundation and uh, IndiaWaterPortal.com. He's also the founder of Rainwater Club uh, and secretary general of International Rainwater Catchment Systems Association. So uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have you today. Uh, moving on, uh, we, we also have um, Mr. Swayam Prabhada, uh, Ms. Swayam Prabhada, uh, Project Analyst, uh, UNDP. Uh, Dr. Ms. Swayam Prabhada is personally working, presently working with uh, UNDP and is focused on building the water portfolio. She has over 24 years of experience in the policy and program management, cutting across social, environmental, developmental areas, including human development and skin development. However, her interest in environmental issues have always found included in the social sectors as well. She has experience working with government, NGOs, and IGOs. Uh, presently, she is working on developing a multi-stakeholder partnership platform to focus on water conservation and management and gender mainstreaming in the water sector. Thank you for joining us today, ma'am. Um, Next, we have Garvita Gulhati. Garvita is a BTEC student from Bangalore and founder of Why Waste, an organization that is working towards effective conservation of water. Uh, they are today India's largest youth-led organization working towards water uh, conservation. The startup works with restaurants by helping them prevent wastage of water that is left behind in glasses uh, through their viral glass 
powerful movement in addition to conducting workshops at schools colleges ngos and offices to raise awareness on water conservation beyond this garvita represent uh, represents the voice of youth and works deeply towards involving more young people and in changing uh, change making through her work with global organizations like fish facebook Ash ashoka google and global change makers to name a few garvita is an uh, ashoka young change maker global change maker and change.org fellow she also serves on the board of uh, state of youth a virtual na uh, nation for ev everyone below the age of 24 advocating for sdgs garvita is so happy that you're with us today Uh, we, we have Gayatri Kupendra Reddy uh, with us today and Gayatri is the founder of CREATE Foundation. CREATE is a social entrepreneur uh, enterprise that focuses on identifying solutions to Bangalore's city's rapid urbanization impact uh, with regard to infrastructure and water conservation. CREATE has been actively working on increasing community awareness towards uh, the need for better urban planning and development. Um, she's an active member of Global Shapers Bangalore and uh, contributes uh, to our uh, Environment Vertical on Awareness and other initiatives. It's so glad to have you, uh, Gayatri. Just to give a short introduction about myself, I'm a lawyer by profession and uh, I head the uh, uh, Environment Vertical for Global Shapers Bangalore. I'm also a trained climate reality leader. I have about 5.5 years of experience in the legal field. Um, so let's, uh, I'm just going to, uh, you know, narrate a short uh, experiential uh, uh, view. Um, what crosses your mind when an aged farmer in a village in Karnataka says that he cannot predict the weather patterns like before? Or when a woman in Ugandan village talks about never seen before torrential rains res uh, result in floods and severe drought thereafter? Or when the indigenous tribes in Amazon speak up uh, for their environmental and te uh, territorial rights as um, Amazon fire rages, or it could even be the Australian fires uh, of late. Or when you read about IPCC warning that a 3.6 degree rise above pre-industrial levels would precipitate an extensive extension of species across the globe, rendering much of the globe uninhabitable. The signs are clear and all of these signs uh, uh, pose a lot of questions to us, right? Um, so I, I, I myself have a lot of questions. I myself have a lot of questions and uh, so without further ado, let me start with those questions to the panel. Uh, what is the primary medium through which we can feel the effects of climate change for sure? So, uh, so could one of you explain the impact of climate change on water and how the two are inextricably linked? In simple words, picking examples from local and relatable issues. Uh, Vishwanath sir, could you please uh, start? Can you hear me? Yep. Sanjana, can yep. you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you now, sir. Okay. Yeah. So any question for me? Uh, sir, I just posted a question to Vishwanath, sir. As soon as it finishes, okay. uh, you can take it up. So here's, here's what's happening uh, with uh, climate change and global warming. As the temperatures rise, the ability of the atmosphere to hold water increases. Uh, you have a negative impact in terms of glaciers melting, the northern polar ice cap melting, sea levels rising, but also you see that there's much more water vapor in the air. Uh, which means that uh, with the changing wind pattern and with increasing humidity in the atmosphere, you get unseasonal rainfall. Uh, you exacerbate certain effects like, for example, the El Nino or La Nina. These are things still under uh, study. But what, what it does is it uh, exacerbates uh, climate variability. Rainfall patterns change, intensity of rainfall changes, the areas at which rainfalls changes, and therefore, we have to start to adjust to the new normal, as it's called. Uh, continents like Australia have gone through a severe drought for 20 years. Uh, they have now recovered, but then they have been subjected to flooding, and you saw the big fires there. Uh, in a nation like India, which is completely dependent on the monsoon, any variability in the monsoon means a great economic burden, especially to those uh, whose livelihoods are 
intimately connected to rainfall, like farmers, right? small and marginal farmers. So that's what's happening in the big picture, and it's water, which is the medium through which we understand climate change almost immediately. Uh, the level of uh, carbon in the atmosphere is not something that we perceive. The rainfall patterns we do, and what, with the changing monsoon, uh, with the changing rainfall patterns and the intensity of rains, we know what it means, what climate change means to us. Right, sir. Like you, like you mentioned, I think the effects of climate change are much more clear through the water cycle. Uh, would anyone else like to add uh, and bring in any 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 other perspective to uh, the link between water and climate change? Just adding to what sir was saying, I feel like. Um, so is right. It is a primary medium through which we can understand. We are, or other countries can really understand what what is happening temperature wise. Because many countries are going through drought that basically is lack of water. Then there is too much flood, which is excess of water. Then we have all of this constant. Uh, even our infamous Bellendur Lake, right? What what really has happened is the con there is because of less water. There is concentration of pollutants which is again an indicator that water and climate change are really very um, interlinked and it is a primary medium through which we can understand um, the current state and how the future of water is going to be. Right, Gayatri Swam Prabha, do you have anything to add? I just wanted to say even the storm surges have increased in intensity and that has actually affected the coastal areas. And when disasters strike, sometimes we are, uh, you know, there's a lack of preparedness, no matter how much we prepare, there's always the disaster leaves behind a trail of loss to life and property. So probably uh, these kind of frequency increases in the intensities and the frequency is something which is intrinsically linked to climate change and uh, the temperature and the precipitations as well. So that's something that we are trying to be prepared for, but uh, I don't know how far and how fast are we adapting to those changes. So it's not just about climate change uh, adaptation, mitigations, but it is also changing our lifestyle that I feel uh, is also very intricately linked with climate change issues. The food we eat, the water we drink are no longer the same. So even the air we breathe. So if you go back and see, I think I'm sure uh, the pollutants are also kind of, um, kind of um, increasing or linked to climate change in many different ways. Thank you. Uh, Garvita, you said you wanted to add a few things to this. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to also highlight that every single part of the environment is so interrelated um, and water in some form is actually a part of our community in everything that we see and everything that we do. You know, something as simple as your t-shirt takes almost 2000 liters of water to manufacture. So water is everywhere around us um, and you know kind of linking it to how it is related and how every single part of the environment being destructed actually leads to some other bit you know going wrong so take for example deforestation when you cut off trees you loosen the soil and now they, they cannot hold enough water so you have lesser water going into the ground um, and so there is all of these things that are very very interrelated and like uh, Swayam Prabha ma'am also mentioned that you know um, we all are seeing it happening in so many different places and in so many different ways um, every single part of it needs to kind of be understood interrelated and then we need to figure out where exactly the difference can you know be started to make right Garvita uh, Colonel uh, would you like to add something You can speak now, I've unmuted you. I think there's some technical issue. So uh, like you all mentioned, uh, I think it's very important that we uh, understand the changes in water availability and how it will impact health and food security as well, uh, while we are thinking of mitigation and adaptation strategies. 
and have uh, and these have already proven uh, because they've ten they've tended to trigger uh, refugee dynamics and political instability as well so in this regard what are some of the nature based or innovative solutions that are available to tackle climate and water crisis together can you hear me sanjana yes sir we can hear you uh, were you able to hear the question no no i have i haven't heard any question i was not able to get clear audio okay sir now what was the uh, question so now we were just talking about uh, what are some of the nature based or innovative solutions that are available to us to tackle climate change and water crisis would you like to start okay yeah yeah if you are gone ahead i can join you wherever you have uh, reached right so vishwanath sir can you please uh, could you please uh, throw some light on the question we were just uh, posting so what was the question uh, what was the question you were talking about the first question or uh, you gone ahead everybody has spoken and then you have come to right. the next question so we we moved on to the next question we just spoke about the linkage yeah let between... me know the next let me know the next question right the next question is what are some of the nature based or innovative sol solutions that are available to tackle climate change and water crisis together okay Vishwanath sir, who, 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 who? Uh, so let Vishwanath sir take lead, and then yeah, yeah, please, 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 please go ahead, please, please go ahead. All right. Well, uh, there are many scales at which nature-based solutions can work. I'll just try and uh, highlight two of them. One of them is the mangrove ecosystem, which is there in the delta and the coastal areas. Now, holding on to the mangrove ecosystem, making sure that it's not decimated making sure that it's protected and enhanced protects us against uh, tidal surges and uh, impacts from mm -hmm. cyclones like right? so this is a nature based solution which is waiting for us to protect our coastal areas and we have to pay more attention to the mangrove system in the urban areas where i work we have something called constructed wetlands the example of belandur lake was mentioned by gayatri now constructed wetlands are a good way of managing wastewater which is now in abundance in our cities and which unfortunately is untreated but constructed wetlands can help do the polishing uh, removing nitrates phosphates and heavy metals and making sure that this water is clean enough for us to become available for reuse say for agricultural purpose or for recharging the aquifers or even for industrial purpose constructed wetlands enhance biodiversity too if they are managed well and can bring bring back uh, flora and fauna to our cities if they are done in our cities and if it's done in the periphery it can also help enhance uh, livelihoods uh, because constructed wetlands provide livelihood of opportunities to many farmers right so these are just two examples we have to look at for example regenerating forests we are making sure that old growth forests are protected there's a whole range of nature based solutions which are available to us to start to work with water and climate change thank you sir uh, that was very helpful because we always tend to focus on like only the coast or the rural but you also brought in solutions that can be implemented in urban spaces as well um, uh, like the nature based solutions um, colonel would you add uh, like to add something to that yeah only thing i would like to add into this is that uh, working in the rural area urban area one must understand the uh what is the water situation there you know every place whether it's a government whether it's a maharashtra or you go to assam or you go to odisha or other states in india you will find the water potential is different at every place so my way of working is which i am following for last uh, 17 years now is uh, check up the water potential of the particular area if we have to see that uh, climate change and the uh, availability of water as such in that particular case because in uh, in india or anywhere in the world for that matter on a 1000 square feet of a catchment area a 100 mm of rainfall will give you 10000 liters of water plain simple mathematics so if that is known to us like if i am in pune Pune receives 750 millimeters of rainfall. That means a catchment area, anything of a thousand square feet, receives annually 
75,000, around 75,000 liters of water. If you move to Bombay, which has got about 2,500 millimeters of rainfall, it jumps to 2,50,000 liters. So this is the availability of natural bounty with you on, whether it's a rooftop, whether it's on the roads, or it is on the farmland, wherever it is. If the question is, how are we using it? Mostly we have found out that at least my, um, my experience says so that the most neglected uh, water is the rainwater which is falling on our rooftop. Taking a case of Pune, Pune has got about 15,000 registered societies and only 3,000 societies have so far done rainwater harvesting. Well, unless and until you start using your own water, which is falling on wherever you are staying, you will not be able to meet the water availability. Well, ultimately, in a city, the natural water assets are constant. One is your uh, rainfall. Another is rivers and the groundwater. These are the three natural assets, water assets available with you. With a rising population, nothing is going to change. In case of Pune, 1950, the population was only 5 lakh. Today, it is plus 50 lakh. But the water, natural water assets have remained same. The, it hasn't changed your rainfall. It hasn't cha changed the number of uh, rivers. Groundwater table is naturally going down. So here, what I wanted to say is, wherever you go, unless until we start spreading awareness, and mind you, in 2000, if you check up uh, wherever, whichever state you are staying, uh, kindly check up with the state government rule on roof of rainwater harvesting. This particular GRs were made in the year 2002 to 2004. Now that, that clearly um, makes it a mandatory for all the buildings, government and public buildings to have compulsorily rooftop rainwater harvesting. How many cities where you are in Bangalore or I'm in Pune or somebody in Bombay, somebody in Delhi, how many of us are aware that this particular GR is followed in principle? Why, why I'm bringing this particular issue is wherever you are working, you will find that people are telling about the Pani name is right. Water availability is very low. And the water availability is very low. He should be told there is water available with you in plenty. And wherever, in six states, I'm seven states I'm working. And most of the places I have found out that this gives you, uh, this improves definitely your water availability. Just, just to bring a focus on this climate change definitely uh, disturbs our monsoon cycle. But the amount of rainfall still remains the same. It may increase slightly bit of it, only in changes monsoon cycle may disturb monsoon cycle it may delay monsoon you will have a heavy rainfall in a short period of time but right. at the end of the day when you calculate it at the year calculations which will remain almost same so that's what i just wanted to put it across what i have seen is so climate change will definitely disturb our monsoon cycle because that is the primary source of water on the planet only right. thing we have to do is how we can make the best use of it right so, like uh, uh, Colonel mentioned that uh, he's talking about the roof, rooftop rainwater harvesting or uh, conservation of water from the rainfall itself. Uh, alongside this, what, are, what could be some of the either like well-tested uh, traditional methods for rainwater harvesting or if, if that is one of the best methods or not? That's my question. But these are the well if you see the history go back in history in the back you'll find rainwater harvesting was used in india uh, written history 4500 bc when you check the documents you'll find it was used then also right, probably sir. what so happened you, if you like, check up and analyze it right. when the tap hello yeah can you hear I was, me? I was just saying could some of you elaborate on some of the other traditional methods or uh, other conservation methods which are available to us as solutions or even if they were traditional like how how can they be adapted to modern times 
I think the simplest. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think the simplest one, and I think the one that we always forget is the preservation of our lakes, because those are really the most natural um, spaces that are defined um, for preserv for water conservation, and they they are the largest spaces that are defined for percolation of ground for of groundwater. Now that we have so many disappearing lakes, I think um, I think uh, let's. It, understanding that you know we have urban cities have to grow make space for you know people coming in we need to in our town planning define spaces where um consciously make efforts in our urban planning um to include more spaces um where we can we can have say community spaces where we allow for percolation now with in the city in bangalore especially we are seeing a lot of um, white topping happening. White topping. IIC has said released a report saying, "Oh, this is the this will not allow for groundwater recharging." Um, so, what are we doing to sort of balance this out? You know, we are creating spaces, we are creating better roads, but we're forgetting to recharge the water. So, either we preserve the lakes going forward, or right. we define community spaces where we all come together and take care of. Um, uh, consciously create these spaces that allow for percolation. I think that was my solution for this. Right, I think that was a very good point that along with rooftop rainwater harvesting, uh, there should be uh, community ownership as well for the solutions that are available. So I'm Prabha, would you like to throw some light on uh, some of the innovative solutions that are available to us? Um, I think I would like to look at the catchment areas, uh, complementing what Vishwanath has already talked about, the mangroves. So the catchment areas are very critical. And uh, as already Gayatri has mentioned, that we are encroaching upon all these green spaces. So probably that should be one of the major focus, that uh, how do you uh, hold on to your catchment areas? If there are no catchment areas, you probably won't be able to do much, uh, be it uh, a lot of water at one point in time or uh, the frequency different or whatever. So uh, I think uh, what I would like to also say is uh, rainwater harvesting is also a very important uh, way of uh, getting our groundwater recharged, especially in the urban areas. Um, that apart, the springs uh, in the mountains uh, are also a source of water. And uh, some of them have kind of dried up. Uh, Dhara Vikas uh, in Sikkim has been a very successful spring water management project. So that could be one of the ways of tackling uh, water issues, water woes in the mountainous regions. And UNDP has recently started working in Urissa uh, in the tribal districts. Uh, with Gram Vikas, where we are trying to harness the potential of the springs in that area. That's called the Thousand Springs Initiative with the communities. So I feel that nature-based solutions with the communities from a um, uh, conservation management governance perspective uh, would take us a longer way to tackle climate change and water woes. Uh, be it agriculture, be it industry. So we first have to save our sources. So right. as um, you know, we would say from the source to the sea, so we would have multiple interjection points uh, for trying out our nature-based solutions. Thank right. you. So I think uh, when you spoke about the Thousand Springs Initiative, uh, the, uh, another very important thing is the focus on the vulnerable communities and those that are being left behind, right? So ensuring everyone has access to sustainable water and sanitation services is a critical climate change mitigation strategy. Uh, for the years ahead. So how can we involve young people to take ownership of this? That's my question. Garvita, would you like to start with this? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so Sanjana, first of all, um, to begin with, don't really understand how grave the issue actually is and um, how interlinked it is. So, of course, you know, we're out there, we're fighting for climate change, we're fighting the, for the betterment of the planet, but a lot of people don't know the intricacies. So, when I actually get to interact and meet with so many youth, they understand that they know that there's a problem and they want to solve it, but they don't know where to start. So, you know, a, a very simple solution for this that a lot of 
fields. Uh, but another thing is you can't just plant a tree in your uh, backyard. Of course, you know, that's uh, going to be helpful. Uh, but at the same time, what we also need to do is build ecosystems because when you uproot a forest, you're uprooting an entire ecosystem. Your trees are protecting you from air pollution. They are, they, they are helping conserve groundwater, a lot of species and every single thing is very interlinked. In fact, even right now, I happen to read a lot of articles on how the coronavirus and um, all of these other different problems that are happening in the world are actually because of climate change. Um, and because we have destroyed the original ecosystem, humanity as such. Um, so, you know, uh, trying to involve youth more in those kind of solutions, which so we, we, to a certain extent, we also have limitations when we go out and work because there's only a certain amount that we can do. Um, so trying to build solutions where youth can be involved um, is amazing and, and a really amazing uh, youth-based solution that I happened to come across recently is how a bunch of young people are trying to convert <coughs> cities to sponge cities, which where, uh, where, so because we've covered the layer of our earth with concrete. Water isn't really percolating. And at the same time, the runoffs are leading to much higher levels of water pollution in the already existing water bodies. Um, so this, this way, uh, and I think Berlin in Germany is a really great example of a sponge city where they're actually able to absorb all the water and send it back into the ground and this is just you know one of those very simple solutions that that is actually happening out there and i think the second and the most important thing that young people can go out there and do is really tell people um how they should judiciously use water on a daily basis itself um each and every one of us the quantity of water that we use can make a huge difference on this planet um we need to remember that how we need, we need to every day remember how privileged we are and um how there are actually people you know who are walking miles to just get a single drop of water um so I think trying to build that form of awareness, which I believe is there in the youth, but giving them solutions that they can implement right now will get them more involved in solution building. Right. This is why I'm from a, like uh, Garvita was saying, she was talking about what we could do in our capacity. Why do we as youth feel limited uh, today? Do you think we are not represented enough or do you think we're not involved in policy making enough? Are we not having the right powers? Uh, what what do you think is the uh, like some of the issues that young people are facing in getting more actively involved in solution building? Uh, I think the youth uh, have very good ideas, but uh, they do not have that space to actually implement it, try it. So if we uh, from the uh, non governmental sector and also encouraging through the government sector, the Atal Innovation Missions. Can we use all of these uh, to kind of come up with ideas, youth voices? Uh, that would be a great platform. Uh, in fact, uh, UNDP, uh, we have just kind of initiated a Water Matters, a dialogue on Water Matters, Agenda 2030 platform. And that platform is open to anybody and everybody who would like to contribute. Uh, but uh, with a very focused agenda. So that could be one way where we can get the voices in of the youth as well. And that has uh, larger organizations also involved, which are into policy, program, grassroots. So if we have these kind of water platforms, um, and also maybe at the city level, that could be a great start. Yeah. And uh, you know, water is, if you uh, go back and look, water is actually a state subject. So we can begin, we can begin with our cities. We can begin with our district level work, scale it to the state level. And you know, if um, Garvita and people like her with the youth voice, if you can just <clears throat> stop and see what is missing in that policy document, and what could be uh, done, then I'm sure Viswanath and Gayatri and Sanjana and everybody would come together and that could add on to the voices of the youth and you can take it forward. But the youth have to also make that effort. It cannot just wait for somebody else to come up and say, okay, do you want to join this bandwagon? No, it's not like that. So technology is there and youth are like 
hands-on with technology. Trust me, they're way, way beyond uh, many of us. So that could be a starting point. Policy is what works, what doesn't work. And then the governance mechanism, you can always use some voice, a senior voice, a spokesperson to come with you and talk to the government and with scientific evidence, I'm sure the government will definitely hear you. And you can always have these little policy papers or briefing notes uh, that, you know, you could work with other organizations who are working there. So it cannot, it may not be a lone voice. It could be a voice of the youth together. So there are lots of uh, options out there. You should, but I would suggest that one should just go to the field and experience before you start talking. Because sometimes uh, we start talking in the air, yeah. but not till you see the reality, it doesn't hit you. And it's always lip service. And that doesn't take us anywhere. Right. So you should be working uh, in the field. And there are lots of organizations who can give that opportunity. So first, we need to build our own capacities. And then we start talking on the policy and governance. That, uh, that will change the entire narrative. Right. And um, there are lots of platforms. There are lots of ways that we could do it with technology and uh, connectivity is not a problem. Right. But just to add, Swayam Prabha, very often, you know, when we go out there as youth and we share, even if it's just a policy change, if we share our opinions, it's still, um, you know, recorded as something that a young person has said. And it might not be, you know, paid as much heed to as what someone as experienced as you people would say. Um, so I think that gap still exists. And I, I also often experience it, but I think there is a mindset shift um, and it's slowly happening. So hopefully, you know, with the help of people like you, it can grow better. Of course. And there are always local leaders and local champions who should be with you guys. And you should, you know, it's not about youth and us, uh, you know, who have worked in the field. It's always a combination. We are also <laughs> learning. So it's not like always the youth voice. And I'm sure, Viswanath, you also agree that when we work, we always have uh, young people giving us that energy and new ideas. So it's always a combination how it works. So don't lose hope. We are all there. Thank you. Um, I, I, I don't feel too old myself, though I've been in the sector for 35 years. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I mean, I still consider myself a youth when it comes to the excitement that uh, working in the water and wastewater sector offers. But I have another different perspective to what Garbita is bringing. Garbita is absolutely right that we must listen to the young people a lot more. We must listen to women a lot more and girls a lot more. And, and uh, that's missing in policy spaces. It's usually old men who sit around there and uh, talk away to and uh, generate a lot of hot air which adds to the global warming. But my experience of the field has also been different, Garbita, and I think you will agree, and Gayatri will also agree. I have seen a lot of young farmers dealing with climate change in a very practical way on their fields. Mm -hmm. I've seen fishermen grappling with the change in their lake water level and finding solutions. And these are all young people, right? I've seen young well diggers who understand what rainwater harvesting is about and how to put uh, rainwater into the, uh, into the aquifer and have become part of the million wells program that we've launched in Bangalore to dig a billion recharge wells. These are all young well diggers, right? We have a community of young people from rural areas and from not so privileged backgrounds who are already part of the solution. I think the privileged youth have to start to get into a dialogue with the not so privileged solution seekers on the field and then develop a partnership to push it to scale and push it to policy level. I think that's where the solution lies. Uh, yeah. Agreed, sir. Just adding quickly to what we're discussing, um, I think, you know, although our consumption patterns are fashioned over a long period of time and we all think that it's going to take longer to change them, I feel like when we look at, um, look, look at things like water, right, the biggest thing that we always, um, I think that we always forget to look at is the holistic picture of who are the other stakeholders that will get involved in it. Like we always do not think about um, educational institutions who have the ability to in, to incept the idea from from the very beginning. We don't think about the corporates because they have the ability to start a movement. You know, if Google did something, a hundred other companies will start uh, working on it. So again, similarly, individuals are um, working on um, working on furthering the cause. We also forget 
the in, uh, entrepreneurs and independent businesses who are small but in a country like india are a large chunk of um a chunk to our chunk in the you know ecosystem so we always have to make plans that is inclusive so the policy needs to involve and include um all of the other stakeholders and then it has to be a policy i think that's the gap i find in you know within the government and the system that exists right now and it's not only exclusive to our country but it's everywhere i think very very true uh, gayatri like you said everyone has a role to play and and definitely we cannot afford to wait we we need everyone everyone to take action and everyone to be involved so like moving further can you like tell us uh, what each one of us can do in our capacity to manage what are better what are the measure we can measures we can adopt in the short term and long term to conserve water and also uh, uh, you know tackle climate change in the on the way uh, is that me yeah any one of you could start that you can start yeah again long term long term the policy needs to think about it because as individuals we can we can do a lot but until the policy does not support us right until until the um, the, the government does not get involved and does not get serious then what we do is really not um does not really meet its full 100% potential um so i think in the long term the policies really need to get aligned with the individuals and we need to get current if that is a word i can use because a lot of policies are made based on some previous data that and world is changing at a much faster pace right now so that policies are not keeping up with the the time that is the time lapse that is happening right now so that in the long term i think that is my solution but in the short term of course um that we can do individually we can do a lot from you know fixing that tap to using less water when we wash our hands and being more conscious um on how we consume water not only water all the natural resources um i think that are my short term long term um solutions right garvita uh, what's your take on that yeah so i agree with gayatri on both you know the short term and the long term as well where we do need policies that would make a much larger difference but there are also so many policies that are in place that are not being implemented properly um, or that are not you know being cared about because just because they are an environment related policy so it is not that important um, sorry is colonel saying something uh, no go ahead go ahead so we also kind of as citizens um so there are you know there are obviously different aspects of the policy some we follow as citizens um something very simple that every apartment and every household that was constructed after a particular year needs to have a rainwater harvesting system are all the citizens actually following it uh then there are corporate related um policies where you're not you're not allowed to let water run off in particular water sorry your waste run off in particular water bodies are all of them actually following it are people actually keeping a check and uh personally speaking in terms of you know rainwater harvesting being implemented in every home that's now being constructed i'm i'm very sure that it's not under check because i actually know people who have recently uh constructed houses and they don't have the rainwater harvesting systems so one obviously is to you know kind of make sure that the already existing policies also start being implemented um would be also a very important step to take um additionally you know there's there's a lot happening you know encouraging people to come up with solutions uh, helping them build it uh, giving them the funding to do it etc so i think that, that all of that is definitely happening and yes again on the short term very similar to our pledge of today um anyone and everyone if you can just pick up that one change that you know you want to bring about in your life um 
it can make a huge difference on the long run and then finally educating people about the crisis and how they can play a role is also very important because as we grow up in school we learn about so many different things but often we forget to learn um, how we can also you know do our part and help the planet so um, involving young kids in schools uh, from a very very young age in fact into learning developing and understanding problems around them will you know definitely so so like even Vishwanath sir said earlier that youth have a lot of amazing ideas and these ideas get sparked better when we're taught from a very young age because that's when our minds are curious and inquisitive and rational like more than they are when we get older so uh, that can really spark some interesting uh, and creative solutions I believe um, so yeah that that's another thing I think that should be done um, more intensively. Vishwanath sir, what do you think are the solutions where everyone can get involved and uh, uh, solve this crisis? Well, uh, one of the things to understand is that water is a political subject first, and then it's a, a technical subject or, a, or, or any other issue. And water is about universal rights, right? It, water is a human right as much as sanitation is a human right. So I think for the young people, we need to become what, what I would call water literate. Understand what are the social and political dimensions of water. Why is there injustice? Why is there inequity? What, why is there an ecological illiteracy, which is widely prevalent in governance? Why do we take crazy decisions which destroy the environment uh, in the name of development, this sort of contradiction between environment and development? Why is that happening? A lot of uh, work has happened on that. But I think the young people have to become way, way more politically active. There is a, a space for advocacy. There's a space for building narratives which will influence policy. Policy is not written in vacuum. It comes from the narrative which is in the media, which a lot of people are voicing out, right? So try and do that. Try and become water literate and then try and spread the message of water literacy to as much of the community as, as is possible. You know, so the two big challenges before us in the world, in the water world, one is foremost a social challenge, that a lot of people do not have access to water, do not have access to sanitation. The second is the ecological challenge. Both cannot function without the other. The ecological challenge has also to be addressed, but it has to be addressed with a social perspective in mind. You know, some water for all, not all water for some. Let's reduce inequities. These are the kind of uh, uh, challenges which the young should pick up and should start to address uh, at scale and therefore become water literate. Right, so, uh, Swam Prabha, would you like to add some? Like to add something to that? Yeah. Um, actually, I would just pick up where Vishwanath just stopped. I said water also has economic value, so it's not just looking at from the social and the environmental aspects of it, but it has a very high economic value. The earlier uh, we understand that, the better we would be. So every drop saved is a every drop of future that we are uh, saving. So if we look at it from an economic perspective, probably uh, it would make more sense to a lot of us. And SDG 13, which is on climate change and SDG 6 are intricately linked. And that is also linked to human development. So as you rightly said, it's access, it's quality, it's quantity. It is also health and education that's linked. And climate change is also linked to your health aspects very clearly. And water plays a very critical role when we are talking about health issues. And uh, safe hands, washing hands uh, has been the narrative over the past few days, which shows how important water is to our daily life. But then being responsible on how much and how far we use it and how much we waste. What actually uh, makes me ponder is that the amount of extractions that we are doing, the amount of water that flows down our drain, we are not actually accounting for it. So water budgeting accounting from my uh, thinking would be one of the first ways to move forward to see how much water per capita we are using, urban versus rural, women, children, disabled. We are not talking about disabled people when we talk water, which is, uh, should be the narrative. There's huge lot of migrations that happening because of climate change and water. Are we taking that into our narrative? We must, because these are the social 
changes that's happening, which has an economic impact, not just environmental impact. So if we look at it from all of these perspectives, a holistic view of water in the center would help us build for policies and programs better. And that provides us for opportunities to come together and work as one and leave no one behind that we've been talking about uh, has been one of the crux uh, of the agenda 2030 and all. So probably we should be able to uh, move faster. And SDG 6 actually is uh, the way we are going. We will never fulfill uh, our targets and goals in that uh, SDG, unfortunately. So a convergence attitude at the policy level, talking between the ministries, so water may be with, say, at the central government with the Jal Shakti, but environment is also water. So if you talk about consumptions and productions, that's again water. So water it has to be at the center of so many conversations. So if we can put water at the center of conversations, then probably we would see that we are able to manage our water better and not just talk about water distress, but we would talk about water governance that should be the entire narrative and youth women young old disabled the migration population all feature into a part of it and when we are talking water uh, if i may just take one more minute of your time um, it's also transboundary maybe within states or within countries so it is not just talking water in my uh, kitchen or in my washrooms, but it is also talking water at a very different level. So when I'm, watering, uh, uh, when I'm uh, using water, one needs to be mindful that there's so many more who are not privileged to have that. So we have to build that campaign. Like we do for the food, we should start doing that for water. So if we can change that narrative, put water in the center of it, we will make some progress. Thank you. Right. That that was a uh, really good closing remark of sorts, and uh, I'm I'm very sure like uh, like not leaving no one behind and uh, putting water at the center in all sorts of conversations are something which uh, needs to be done to tackle this crisis. So uh, as closing remarks, uh, I I put out an open question to all of you all. So what do you think uh, is going to secure the future of water going forward from now? Uh, what needs to be done to uh, secure it? Vishwanath, sir, would you like to start? Sure, I'd like to start. I think uh, uh, a lot of it is individual and community action uh, combined with institutional support and government support and governance support. Uh, to see the interconnectedness of it all, as Garvit was mentioning in the beginning, that uh, everything is interconnected in this world of ours, so we must do that realization. Some of the notions that we have, for example, that water flowing into the sea is a waste, those kind of notions have to be sort of got rid of. And we have to start to look at the rights of rivers, the right of nature itself to water, and how do we ensure that those rights are also protected as much as we think anthropo anthropocentrically about ourselves, how do we think about water in its natural state, and how do we celebrate that? That's very important for us to do. Uh, hopefully, we will build much more conversations around it, much more narratives around it, and we'll show a lot of examples which work at different scales and make sure that from the individual level to the state level uh, to the whole globe itself, we're able to seize this opportunity which has come to us in the form of a threat. Right? We shouldn't miss it. We, we, we just don't have any choice. We have to start to work on finding solutions now. Yeah, right. Garvita? Yeah, completely agree with Vishwanath sir again, you know, building those ecosystems back. So a lot of uh, times we don't uh, kind of realize it, uh, but I just take you back a little bit, you know, the time when we, when the world actually started changing environmentally was probably during the industrial revolution, you know, when we actually disrupted what the natural ecosystem was really like and bringing back 
that trying to live our lives more holistically with the environment uh, is i think definitely important and i think the second thing would be participation of all um where every single person um is a part of this movement every institution every from wherever you come and whatever you do you know because um each and every one of us seem to be affected in a different way but there are still some people who are more affected than others um and obviously then it is our duty as people um who have the capacity to help them to do that again so participation by all is i think the, the other very very important thing for us to you know kind of do and uh, la lastly i wanted to just build on the point that swayam prabha ma'am said about you know the economic aspect of it um sometimes you know that there's that whole debate of economy versus ecology um but i think there can be a balance that is struck between both and uh, i think we need to find innovative ways to strike that balance because we need to uh, we need obviously an economy as well but at the same time we need to conserve our ecology um and i'm sure that we all together can find some solution for it so working towards that should be the next step too that would you like to go on next yeah i think my um my point of view is um a little bit on consciousness um i think just just by now we're going to have we're going to start summer in india right so in bangalore specifically we're going to uh, most places are going to run out of water and the solutions that we have been implementing so far is oh let's get a tanker of water and then we get the tanker and then we use the water and then we get another tanker and we've been doing this but consciously if you look at it um you're not solving the problem you're just making you're taking the problem and making it bigger and making it somebody else's problem in the future the place that you're bringing the water from is also going to run out of water so you essentially you're not solving the problem of oh what are we going to do about water in the future we're just passing the problem on so i think it's a little bit of a question on how are we going to find the right solution for this kind of a problem um and how are we going to be conscious about it um this is something that i wanted to add to this right so colonel also has sent his closing remarks he oh, unfortunately had to um, log out because so uh, his connection was not stable so he talks about 3 r's and 1 c which are prime uh, for for to tide over the water crisis one is recharge collect every drop of rain water from catchment areas like rooftop to recharge depleting uh, ground water table using rain water harvesting methods second one is recycle gray water uh, i think we had a lot of questions from the audience regarding gray water uh, from daily water supply of 135 liters per person around 65 liters get converted into gray water so this is something which he says that should be channelized and um, the third one is reuse recycle gray water for flushing and gardening purpose and the fourth one uh, the c is the conservation conserve every drop of water supplied and the about uh, practices will uh, help improve water availability is what uh, his uh, comments are um, so uh, we have, we've had a lot of questions uh, in the sign up form itself uh, so uh, we are we have reached 7 o'clock but if uh, uh, the attendees are okay and the panelists are also uh, if you don't have any other commitments we can extend it by another 15 20 minutes if that's okay yeah, yeah. all all right so from the questions uh, i broadly divided them into lakes questions on lakes rivers water conservation uh, solutions climate and water water in different sectors wastewater and then some of them have asked about future of water also so to begin with we can take in few questions which deal with water in different sectors so there have been questions uh, uh, some of, some of the uh, attendees here are also from the agriculture sector they are from different industries and some of them uh, like gayatri are from big, bigger corporations as well so um, so their question is uh, how how do they how should water and climate change be uh, seen in all of these different sectors because either it's looked at in a way that it's a water intensive sector or uh, 
uh, it's looked at in another way saying climate change is affecting this sector but how how should like say agriculture um, manage these two vishnu sir because you've traveled widely and you've seen the solutions that are sort of available can you tell us uh, well uh, one of the things uh, in the agricultural sector which we have to do which strikes out stands out for india is that uh, we are one of the largest consumers of groundwater and groundwater is the base for agriculture in india as much as dams and reservoirs provide water but it's groundwater actually which provides perhaps 65% of agricultural water use right and we also to realize in agriculture that it's only three crops which consume about roughly 70 to 80% of the water rice wheat and sugar cane so we must develop strategies by which the livelihoods of farmers are protected their income is protected but at the same time we make the right choice with the crops the solution for better water management in agriculture does not lie in water alone it lies mostly in crop choices we make and crop choices are affected by many things you know including purchase minimum support price the kind of food that we in the urban areas try uh, try and eat the export policies that work on it so we have to bring coherence between food policy and the water policy for agriculture to become sustainable in water use of course we need to develop micro level plants at the watershed and at the sub aquifer level so that each sub aquifer and each micro watershed understands what's the water availability there and then makes the right choice in a democratic fashion to include everybody in that particular watershed in that micro watershed for equitable distribution of water the returns from the water in decentralization empowerment of communities but also policies which focus on crop choices the right crop choices is the way to go in in, in agriculture and water right um garvita you said you had something to add to this yeah i actually wanted to pick up from what vishwanath sir said because i had something to you know follow that uh, so what he talks about crop choices you know wheat and rice are two of the maximum water consuming uh, crops that we have and uh, there are crops like you know millets and legumes that conserve a lot less water to not only uh, produce but also to cook you know moving forward and obviously there all they have a bunch of health benefits as well so you know like we created the whole movement of turning vegetarian or vegan if people if consumers itself start demanding uh for foods that are like you know millets and um, all of these different things we can we are the ones who are going to change the face of it because it's we who uh, demand which is why they produce and supply so till the time we don't change our habits of consuming uh, they are not going to change their habits of growing because till the time there's demand there's going to be supply and again quickly just talking about the groundwater so in india we have 22 million bore wells out of which most are depleting at are almost over and in comparison to the us that has only 1 million and china that has only 2 million um so we we're, we're practically mining groundwater and i say mining because we're not replenishing it um in any way at all so uh that is again affecting our farmers in a very big way because they are very very dependent on groundwater so again we as consumers if we change our habits of eating patterns our uh, you know our our different habits these industries are not going to be able to change their habits so something that comes very easy to my mind is like we did the movement of let's turn vegetarian let's turn vegan let's switch to crops that consume much lesser water that's a, that was a very good point garvita uh, gayatri can you throw some light on what businesses can do um, like large corporations can do in uh, conserving water and how can yeah. they bring in responsibility yeah. in water management yeah i think i think the pattern that we've been seeing is that large corporations are always penalized irrespective of whatever industry that they're from they're always penalized and targeted because of um because of who they are and the size that they are and the sheer revenue that they make i think what we need to do broadly is to incentivize it for not only large corporations but for every stakeholder that comes into the community that is a part of this ecosystem there has to be a method of incentivizing it um instead of saying you've consumed more water and here's a bill for or like here's a penalty for you you say hey you've consumed lesser water than you thought or that you than you projected and and then you incentivize that and you know how 
yeah so i think that's a big thing for me where instead of punishing somebody how can you turn it around turn it around and make it a more positive reinforcement of sorts mm, if right yeah. uh, so i'm prabha would you like to throw some light on this i actually wanted to touch upon the agriculture bit first so sure, sure please uh, uh, you know agriculture water is also linked to energy usage so if you provide free electricity how far and how much can you stop water extractions so that is something that uh, has been addressed by i think the government of punjab and they have started um, billing the electricity usage in agriculture and for water basically so these kind of i agree with gayatri when we say that it should be incentivized rather than subsidies i agree with that and that could be a way forward uh, on that and also the kind of uh, water that we are talking about the quality of water uh, especially when we are talking about the kind of pesticides or insecticides that we are using and it's leaking into the soil and into the water that also needs to be addressed with uh, the cropping pattern uh, the less water intense used cropping systems the locally available and the uh, forgotten millets uh, kind of a thing so it's a it's a holistic approach and water cannot be just treated in isolation it's a lot of other things also associated with it so uh, that's what i wanted to add and yes corporate should be um, agree with gayatri they should be incentivized and uh, that should be the way to go forward not just subsidies thank you i just add on the corporate part of it uh, sure sir sure go ahead yeah one of the things that corporates uh, are doing a lot of large corporates is to look at water consumption within their uh, boundaries and trying to become water positive that's la- uh, that's the big thing they do but i think corporates have to start asking themselves about the products they produce and taking the responsibility which is called the extended product responsibility for what it does in the environment and what it does to water right a lot of uh, you know, products tend to damage uh, the environment and corporates have the money to put a lot of uh, thinking into finding solutions right so i'm not trying to blame the corporation alone and just holding them as villains but i'm saying that that kind of uh, extended look at what what the, what does it mean when we produce pesticides or insecticides or weedicides right? what impact does it leave how can it be dealt with more ben- uh, more benignly and much more robustly than is being currently done pollution has a significantly greater impact on the fresh water available than just the mere harvesting of water or the management of water in the product production itself right so when we look at the whole uh, life cycle cost of a product and its impact on water then we'll find better solutions for the future can i quickly add something sure i was reading i was reading on virtual water which actually caught my eyes that the kind of agricultural product that is being exported we see it in tons but actually we do not see as to how much of water it takes to cultivate the, those tons of crops so the virtual water uh, that we don't account for in agriculture could be something that um, would be the next narrative or next discussion point probably and that's a huge water and that would uh, tell us what the water footprint is like could you please elaborate a little more on that i i'm not sure if a lot of us would know about virtual water especially the tendies could you, uh, could okay. you, yeah okay i'm also reading so please bear with me it's just a new topic that i've kind of uh, developed an interest in All so right. when the product is uh, when a crop is being grown say for instance we uh, we have three crops which are water intense right it's cotton sugarcane and rice paddy so when we are exporting crops they use a lot of water or the water used for growing those crops uh, is there so when we are exporting these crops cash crops or whatever we are not accounting for the water that has been used for its production to grow probably 100 tons of uh, paddy how much of water is needed or has been used we are not calculating that so once we calculate that probably the economic value uh, of that product will be much higher than what is there in the export prices right now so that is what i am understanding trying to understand is the virtual water 
uh, that is not being accounted for right now. Uh, so that is how um, the whole concept on virtual water goes, that which is not visible, which is uh, there into the production, but it is not visible. And it could be stretched to other sectors as well, not just agriculture, right. but also to the manufacturing for uh, say, uh, car parts or to any other uh, production uh, as well. Right. So I'm just reading up, but this is an interesting topic we could uh, look into. Right. Vishwanath, sir, could you like talk about virtual water in urban spaces or in our daily lives in urban spaces? Uh, it's a tough one. It's a longer topic. Okay. So it's, a, it's a bit of a controversial thing also. But uh, what happens is, one of the ways to look at it in an urban area is the food on our plate. And what's the virtual water consumption through that food that uh, that we do? There's a physical water consumption, which is 135 liters per capita per day or 200 LPCDI, depending on the area. But there's much more of consumption on a food plate than the real physical water that's consumed also. Also things that we wear, you know, a t-shirt has 3,000 or 5,000 liters of water, embodied water or virtual water, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's a slightly more complex way of uh, calculating water, but it is true that in many parts of the world, from water scarce areas, we are taking out water in the form of virtual water to water rich areas, which is quite a conundrum in, uh, in itself. And somewhere we'll have to start to tweak policies, make sure that that does not happen and that there's a redressal of the balance itself. Right, so Garvita, you had something to add to that? Um, yeah, so again, you know, expanding a little bit more on virtual water, and I think I mentioned it in the beginning as well, you know, that to manufacture a single t-shirt, it takes like 2000 liters of water. So it's all of that water that gets used up in the process. And I think someone even asked a question about is how about an omnivorous diet? Uh, is is it, you know, more sustainable? Uh, sorry, is it uh, is a vegetarian diet more sustainable? And how do you save water? So, you know, to manufacture a single burger, um, a meat burger, it's almost 750 liters of water. Um, and another very interesting fact is a single toilet tissue paper, which we see so many people around the world currently fighting for. A single piece of toilet tissue paper takes almost 15 liters to manufacture just that one piece. Um, and we're cutting millions of trees and we literally just flush those down the toilet. Um, you know, it's like every day when you use toilet paper, you're your, in your lifetime, you would be flushing an entire forest down the drain. Um, so, uh, and you know, just some more numbers, uh, your car takes almost 30,000 liters of water to manufacture. Um, so there are, there are really big numbers like this and every single thing around us has a water tag or a water price, as you might call it. And the, the only thing that can possibly tackle this is to reduce consumerism and to only, only use as much as you need and to realize those things. You know, something as simple as using water in the washroom instead of using tissue papers can make so much of a difference. Um, so, yeah. I think this was something which a lot of them would have been benefited from because this is not so well spoken about and there's not enough research around it. And also um, the product, manufacturers or product makers don't don't uh, uh, sort of account for all of these neither do the governments check for uh, uh, all of these uh, or uh, even during budgeting some of uh, there was some attendee asking a question if how should the water budgeting be done and if all of this is accounted in that is something again which we we'll also have to look at right uh, so in all of this uh, we have another interesting question uh, so People have been asking us if there is any new technology or innovative method to recycle the used water at community level. Uh, because they know that... You want me to go? Uh, yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, we've got a whole range of technologies. If we look at Bangalore City alone, uh, even untreated wastewater, untreated wastewater is being reused by farmers, right? There's a health risk to that. But a lot of work can be done to mitigate the health risk and the environment risk with untreated wastewater alone, right? So, for example, you can grow non-edible crop. You can make sure that the water is put through drip irrigation systems so that the farm workers are not affected. So that's one end of the spectrum. To the other end of the spectrum, there's a gated community called TZ uh, near Vartur, which actually treats its wastewater to 
such an extent that it blends it with groundwater and drinks it. This is the first example of its kind in the whole of India, where a community itself has made, made the choice to treat its own wastewater and make sure that it is good for drinking purposes. And in between, there are many other technologies. So you can now, for example, treat wastewater and send it into uh, agricultural areas for its agricultural use, because wastewater has a lot of nutrients in it, nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, a lot of micronutrients. These are all, uh, from a health risk point of view, things have to be very carefully done and standards and monitoring has to be done very carefully. But these are the new ways that things are going to happen. There's a beautiful wastewater treatment plant in Kabun Park, which has been running for the last 11 years, which treats 4 million liters of water, uh, of wastewater and converts it actually to drinking water standard. But it's used for irrigation purpose, right? So there are various methods and there are biological methods, simple methods which one can use at a household level to community levels where treated wastewater can be reused for landscaping, gardening, toilet flushing, to actually drinking. And that will be the brave new future for us, I'm sure. Right. So is there any resource where people can uh, access all of these solutions? Would all of these be there in Bangalore Urban Waters? Well, we have uh, bengaluru.urbanwaters.in as a website where we are trying to put everything in public domain. Right. One good uh, resource group is something called uh, susanna.org sustainable sanitation alliance susanna.org that's you please a very good website chat box so that people who are in I, I will do that i will do that i will put both the websites on the chat box so people can uh, take a look at more more of the references right so i'm sure you can also leave the platform you were talking about like the undp platform for youth um, i think many of them would like to have a look at that so, um, we are actually developing it, so it's right. not um, available online right now. All right. But if uh, people can um, uh, send in their request to you or on to this, I will take note of that and I will include them uh, sure. into uh, the discussion. Yeah. As, we move as a follow-up to this, when we send out our mails, if there is any response from the attendees, I will connect them. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, there is one... Another important question, which a lot of them have been asking, uh, how is the health sector going to be affected uh, given the coronavirus thing and the COVID-19 uh, uh, outbreak? And um, are we prepared to tackle this? So this is something uh, they're asking. And how is water going to affect the health sector? Also the cholera breakout in Bangalore. Vishnath, sir, can you throw some light on this? Yeah, well, uh, well, uh, let me just tell you one thing about uh, water and wastewater during these uh, terrible times. Right. Uh, the thing with water is that if uh, small precautions are taken, make sure that disinfection is done well, that protective equipment is used by the water workers and the wastewater workers, then it is safe from uh, coronavirus, right? So we don't have to worry about the water supplies as long as uh, proper attention is paid to disinfection and the wastewater. Many apartments and gated communities use treated wastewater. They have to make sure that the disinfection process is followed and that the workers there use protective equipment and then they don't have to worry about reusing the water for toilet flushing or for landscaping. That's at one end of the spectrum. The second end of the spectrum, the availability of clean water for people themselves to be able to take care of personal hygiene, you know, hand washing and other things. So these are very critical times. And I think we'll have to start to take more steps to make sure that clean water becomes more accessible so that people's health uh, is improved. And this is a wake up call to the health sector as well as to the water sector to the critical importance of water during pandemics, right? And the critical impo uh, importance of managing good sanitation and wastewater because bad sanitation and pandemics are absolutely, absolutely connected. True. Um, so I'm Prabha, would you like to add something to that? I think when we talk about health and hygiene, water is uh, an integral, I should say, the central aspect of it. And Vishwanathan has very um, succulently put it out. So I think I'll just rest my case here. All right. I, I'll just add a quick point to that. Sure. Yeah. I feel like um, I feel like we always ignore, or we don't ignore, we don't pay enough attention to urban planning and development because the if we plan it. If the plan consists of separate um, sewage treat, sewage um, segregation or uh, this garbage disposal methods, and then we have freshwater 
fresh freshwater drains and they don't come together so what happened with the cholera thing is where there was waste water that came in contact with the fresh water that came into the homes of people right so that was a big big mistake that urban planning and development was not able to fix real quickly or even anticipate right so we need to segregate the, these systems separate drains have to be made and the water has to flow separately through the city and bangalore city in space in general or is a very growing city we're going to be adding more population we're going to be adding more um more industries and businesses so we need to make sure that the infrastructure is in place and if we think oh yeah it's it's a very complex situation complex scenario we to fix we need a lot of data um the only thing i want to say is as we go forward it's only going to get more and more complicated so we we better start fixing it right now than wait until it gets a lot more complicated and gets to the point where it's then not fixable right can i make a quick addition to the what gayatri said it's a very important point she made urban planning and water and sanitation have to talk to each other yeah. unplanned areas prove the most difficult to manage from a water and sanitation perspective and to retrofit these areas should become very very difficult we have to keep two things in mind one our investment in sewer network has to increase rapidly in almost all our urban areas we must invest in collection conveyance and then treatment of the wastewater but in the meantime on plot systems and smaller systems will be the solution the stop gap solution we have to pay attention to make sure that those on plot systems like septic tanks pit toilets or small wastewater treatment plants are designed well and manned well you know human resource well that there should be trained people who are able to take care of those systems we don't pay attention to decentralized and on plot systems enough we need to start to do that much more rigorously right sir so uh, we still have a lot of questions but i i think we're running out of time and we'll not be able to cover all of them but uh, uh, i will come up with a blog post as a follow up to this and if there are some critical questions which need uh, expert opinions i will get in touch with the panelists and take your views and then add them to the blog along with uh, all, all that we've discussed today so let me quickly uh, uh, like just talk about the future of water project of uh, the global shippers community bangalore i think the video in the beginning was not uh, very great so i'm just going to talk about it quickly so um, are you able to see the ppt yes yeah so who are global shippers community bangalore Uh, born out of the World Economic Forum, the Global Shippers Community is a network of inspiring young people under the age of 30 working together to address local, uh, regional, and global challenges. With uh, more than 10,000 members, the Global Shipper Community spans four tens city-based hubs in 171 countries. Uh, in each city, teams of uh, shippers self-organize to create projects that address the needs of their community. Uh, the bengaluru hub uh, focuses on education environment mental health sustainable fashion and future of work uh, uh, just to throw some light on uh, the future of work project uh, we've been creating awareness about uh, conservation of water through events at universities like ps and lakes such as agra lake we've created awareness by sending out letters to public through partnerships with three different uh, delivery partners such as uber eats and uh, we have also been conducting workshops and hand on hands on activities during uh, our previous connect for climate event at the plytech park and uh, supporting and encouraging entrepreneurs like uh, y waste like garvata and farmland rainwater harvesting system rainy filters smarter homes technology water on meters by giving them platforms to showcase their solutions during our events so this is uh, what uh, the future of Uh, what our project is all about and these are some of the initiatives we have done over the past year uh, we have very ambitious goals and uh, to talk about some of the other projects we have one of it is call for earth uh, which deals with climate change and uh, the kasa story an initiative to rewrite the narrative of bangalore's waste management and uh, the global digital march for voice for the planet these are some of the environmental projects we run in the global shippers community bangalore and we are very open to any sort of collaborations which uh, any of the attendees would be interested in uh, 
we will shortly be starting our on ground activities and i think due to the uh, coronavirus outbreak there has been a break but today we have been successfully able to host the webinar on world water day even though all our physical events got cancelled so i think uh, we need to credit ourselves to that and uh, our partner organizations uh, are why waste garvita would you like to talk about why waste a little bit um yes yeah, sure uh, so what we primarily started out with working on was um at restaurants uh, so when i across this piece of information that 14 million liters of water gets wasted every year simply in the water that we leave behind in glasses at restaurants i was shocked at the fact that you know such a small amount can lead to such a huge impact and so much water getting wasted so i decided to take action um and that's how we you know formed by waste and we built it and today we're across almost 1 lakh restaurants in india and we're now also building chapters internationally uh, through you know some really wonderful organizations and partners uh, and you know beyond that our our basic goal is to educate people and also tell them and come up with really simple ideas that can help change the way people think about this resource uh, the way people use this resource um, and i think finally it our aim is you know that at the end of every single day you ask yourself how much water was i able to save today and uh, we have like an array of initiatives that we do and um, i'll probably just leave my email id here in case anyone has more questions to not take up too much time right um so another organization we have partnered with is climate reality project india climate reality project is uh, an organization started by uh, vice president al gore uh, in the united nation and uh, crp india is the india chapter of uh, climate reality project and uh, we have a few announcements uh, i'm also a trained climate reality leader like i mentioned before so um, uh, going forward the climate reality project india is going to have training sessions uh, depending on the interest of attendees from across india uh, for rainwater uh, for training them in rainwater harvesting and other innovative solutions that are available so if any of you are interested please get in touch with me and i'll also put a word to you when when we when we are going to have these uh, sessions in future this was one of the announcements and i wholeheartedly thank all the panelists and attendees for joining us today um i think it was a great way to celebrate world water day and explore all the kind of uh, solutions that are available and then i think it's a very wonderful day to put water as the at the center of all the conversations and at the center of solutions and um, i'm sure uh, we all have some amount of knowledge today to take away to start working on mitigation and adaptation strategies to uh, tackle cl climate change as well as the uh, manage water better in in this regard so uh, I, i'm uh, thanks to all of you all for joining in um, shortly going to end the call uh, is there anything else uh, anyone would like to add thank you thank no, you thank, thank you thank, thank, thank you, you thank all you yeah. thank thanks atan for joining in today thank you for scheduling such a wonderful session thank you so much it was a pleasure to be with the other panelists right thank you thank also, you also sanjana do you just want to quickly talk about the pledge Edge. yeah um, go ahead tell tell them oh okay i thought you okay so uh, along with global shapers uh, so why we some global shapers have a long connection we've been working together on water projects since last year we hosted world water day last year as well and it was a huge success and we really wanted to do a lot of things this year too but you know because of everything every day we were just you know cancelling one new thing so this finally worked out and we're very glad that all of you could be here um right now we're also running a pledge which you can find on the instagram pages of both global shapers bangalore as well as why waste um tanja you can just leave both the instagram handles on the chat yeah. if possible um yeah. and uh, yeah and it's it's been uh, really really uh, lovely to have everyone and uh, i hope all of you stay safe and uh, save um resources around you <laughs> just a second i'm i'm just adding in the thing and please take the pledge and uh, tag three more people in your contact so that they also take the pledge and keep Well, let's keep this rolling at least till the end of the day. Yeah, Garuda has added a vibe as well. So the pledge is live on both of our uh, social media handles, so you will be able to find it there.
Thanks a lot. Stay safe and uh, have a very good night. Thank you Thank all. You. Bye bye.